Yo, what's up guys? Welcome back to another video. This is a reaction to the Battle of Midway Part 2. If you want to see my Part 1 reaction, you can find it. I literally reacted to it about 16 hours ago and it was posted 8 hours ago from when I'm recording in the morning. This is my earliest reaction for a long time. I'm up early, reacting to videos early. And yeah, I've already seen the reaction to the Part 1 and people seem to enjoy it. And yeah, I've got back to trying to get these videos out as soon as possible and yeah i'll hopefully react to part three tomorrow so i can get them all out but i guess this is sort of japan's response it's harayu's counter-strike so yeah i guess there's one of the japanese what are they called again fleet at fleet like that survived i guess because the other ones were blown up and i'm on fire as we speak no but in this point of time they're still on fire i guess and one survived so we're going to see how it combated and how it sort of fought back I assume this is what this one's about. But yeah, if you want to see some more of my reactions, links are in the description to my Patreon. Oh, to see many different types of reactions that I can't post to YouTube. And yeah, if you want to suggest me some things to watch that I can't watch on here, links are in the description to my Patreon. You can find it there. But yeah, let's jump into this. We're still at June 4th. It's only 10.26 at this point. Crazy how slow the time like passes just reacting to this sort of stuff. Obviously, I've been asleep, so that's why I'm saying it passes slowly. But like in terms of like a battle i don't know how long battles usually are this i guess this all happened in the space of a few hours the next the part three i guess is in the same sort of time frame but yeah we're going to jump into this and check this out <coughs> inside he was ready room there's pictures of it again also imagine how scared you would be after seeing the other aircraft carriers just get obliterated and now you're just the sole one and everything's reliant on you. Was Lieutenant Tomonaga Joishi. He was the airstrike leader that had just battered Midway. He and his fellow airmen were resting when suddenly a pilot walked in and shouted, The Akagi's damaged! The Soryu and Kaga are burning! We're the only ship that hasn't been hit! Tomonaga and the men made their way to the decks to see what was going on. And one can only imagine the shock and horror on the pilots' faces as they saw their fellow sister ships burning fiercely on the horizon. Revenge had to be taken. Some sort of retribution had to be delivered. Okay then. Rear Admiral Yamaguchi now found himself in command of the only operational carrier left in the Kido Butai. Despite the tragedy that had just befallen them, and the grim odds stacked against them, only one viable option remained in the eyes of the Japanese. To strike back. This is the Battle of Midway Part 2, Hiru's Counter-Strike. Yamaguchi wasted no time sending the retaliatory strike. Led by Lieutenant Michio Kobayashi, the strike consisted of a complete squadron of 18 dive bombers with six fighters as escorts. They took off at 10.54. Much was expected from this group as they were all piloted by seasoned veterans and considered by many to be an elite unit. Lifting the fog of war, we can now see that the Americans had three carriers with them, <coughs> operating in two separate task forces. Rear Admiral Frank Jack Fletcher was in overall command. He was a cautious yet prudent commander who had a wealth of combat experience. He had previously fought the Japanese a month earlier at Coral Sea. Damn. Task Force 17 was under Fletcher's direct. A month before he had fought them, but he's back again. This just shows the persistence and the the absolute balls of these men just coming for more and more. So insane, man. Command, and it was centered on his flagship, the USS Yorktown. Sole survivor of Coral Sea, the damaged Yorktown had been quickly patched up and made battle worthy in just two days so that she could participate in the battle. <laughs> Mad. It had been her dive bombers that had shattered the Soryu. Fletcher also had operational command of Task Force 16, which was led by Rear Admiral Raymond Spruance. Task Force 16 contained the Hornet and the Enterprise, and it had been Enterprise's dive bombers that had taken out the Kaga and the Akagi. Currently, all three carriers were waiting anxiously for the return of their strike groups, and unfortunately for the Yorktown, she would be receiving some unwanted visitors as well. Kobayashi was heading her way. Contrary to belief, Nagumo was not a broken man after the disaster at 10.30. 
his reaction was quite defiant. After shifting his flag from the Akagi to the light cruiser Nagara, he ordered the Kirobutai towards the enemy, who were now believed to be only 90 miles away. He optimistically believed he could engage the Americans in a daylight surface action. However, this fanciful notion was shattered when at 1240, reports showed the American forces were heading east and opening the distance. He subsequently changed course as well and began to head northeast. At 10.50, Admiral Yamamoto, commander of the combined fleet and chief architect of the whole operation, was notified of the current situation of Nagumo's mobile force. One can envision his sorrow and dismay upon hearing the news that three of his carriers were on fire. Just like Nagumo, he too was hopeful that a surface engagement could be forced upon the Americans. At 12.20, he issued a series of orders to retrieve the situation. He ordered a concentration of his main warships to come to Nagumo's aid. In terms of air support, Yamamoto ordered the carriers Junyo and Rujo, operating in the Aleutian campaign, to head south to join the Hiru. There was just a problem though. All friendly forces were hundreds of miles away. Both Yamamoto with his main body of battleships and Admiral Kondo with his two fast battleships could arrive no sooner than the following morning. And what? the two carriers, forget about it. They were over two days away. Wait. 200 miles in these th in these times would have taken a whole day to get there the following morning. What the hell? But ultimately, this effort didn't really matter because the Americans had no intention whatsoever of participating in a surface battle. They were heading east, away from the Japanese. Fair enough. So it was... Don't know what they need to do now they're trying to dip. I respect it because they're just like, yeah, we've done everything we can possibly do. Now let's get home, I guess home, and live for another day, you know? Just get away as soon as possible. Up to the hero, with her meager air power alone, to take on the enemy. En route to the reported location, the Japanese air group encountered a group of stragglers returning to their carriers. The six zeros apparently couldn't resist such a tempting target, and eager for revenge, broke ranks to attack them. This turned out to be a foolish move. The aircraft were SBD Dauntless dive bombers, who now without their bombs proved to be very agile and maneuverable. A sharp clash ensued, and although no planes were lost on either side, two Zeros were severely damaged that they had to return to their carriers. The Vile dive bombers now had only four escorting fighters and they were miles behind. This unnecessary skirmish would prove to be a fatal mistake. Oh wow. At 11.52, radar detected the Japanese strike 32 miles out. Yorktown had eight fighters in the air and the majority went in to intercept the strike formation. With their fighter escorts still too far behind to intervene, the attack proved devastating for the vulnerable dive bombers. The dive bombing formation was completely shattered and disorganized. Seven valves were shot out of the sky before the Zeros finally made an appearance, but even then, they only managed to shoot down one Wildcat before losing three of their own. During this engagement, two additional valves were destroyed and another two had to jettison their bombs, which meant it was now up to only seven dive bombers to eliminate a carrier. From, was it 16 and now it's to seven? The bombers decided to split into two divisions to attack the Yorktown. The first would attack directly from the west, while the other four would attack from the southwest, so that they could approach with the sun to their backs. Kobayashi's unit was reputed to be the best dive bombing squadron in the fleet and they would soon confirm their elite status. The attack began at 12.10. The first plane was shot down, but his aim was true, striking the Yorktown abaft the number two elevator. Wow, already? The, second the first attempt to get one of their aircraft carriers or ships um, has already hit. That's such a contrast to what we saw with the, the US um, aircraft trying to attack the aircraft carriers from Japan. Got a near miss, starting a minor fire on the fantail. The third and fourth missed their mark as the Yorktown was turning to port to throw off their aim. But the fifth bomber landed the most damaging blow. It exploded deep inside her hull, damaging the stack uptakes and snuffing out all but one of her boilers. Oh wow. Thick smoke began to gush out and Yorktown speed dropped. 
Then, another heavy hit was scored, knocking out her forward elevator and starting several fires deep in her hull. The attack concluded with the final plane scoring a near miss. Four Bro, minutes imagine how scary this would be, man. Just after the attack, the Yorktown came to a halt and was dead in the water, with heavy fires on board. The carrier was out of operation. So, with this, the people that are still on board, are they helped off? Are they just left? I guess they're not left behind. There's going to be rules with that. That's just brutal. This man. picture shows the dive bombing attack in the initial stages. Notice the damaged dive bomber about to crash into the water. Its tail has been completely shot off. The dives conducted by Kobayashi's unit were nearly vertical and were held steady despite the intense anti-aircraft fire the Americans had put up. Hitting a moving target cruising at 30 knots was no small feat, and the result speaks for itself. Three hits and two damage near misses from seven aircraft? It had been a spectacular performance, one that even the Americans begrudgingly acknowledged. Flipping hell. Kobayashi was not amongst the survivors, but he would have been proud of his unit for this impressive achievement. However, the attack had suffered intolerable losses. Only five of the 18 valves made it back. That's a 72% loss rate. And of the remaining escorts, only one of the four zeros made it home. If the Japanese continued like this, they wouldn't have any more attack aircraft left by the evening. In return for all this damage, the Americans had lost only one Wildcat. The survivors enthusiastically reported to Yamaguchi that they had left a carrier dead in the water and burning fiercely. By this point, the Japanese knew they were facing three carriers, and according to their scorecard, if one had been taken out, it meant that it was now one versus two. The battle could still be won, although a considerable amount of luck would be needed. Two fights, two forty-five. Damn, still going for it. The second strike prepared for their launch. Unfortunately for Yamaguchi, Hiru's carrier attack unit had been the one that had suffered the most losses on the midway strike. So instead of the regular complement of 18 torpedo planes, only 10 Kates were available for the attack. The strike was to be led by Lieutenant Tomonaga. Mate, it's, again, it's insane. They've just had the fleet come back and these people have just seen that from 16 or 18 or whatever, I forgot, only five returned and they're going for i just can't I, I know i keep saying it but i just in this situation the mind what must be going through your head the mindset as well like, i just it's insane it's absolutely ridiculous like it's just i can't get over how scary that feeling must be you just know there's such a low chance of you returning earlier his plane had suffered a hit and although it had been patched up it kept leaking fuel meaning he might not have enough fuel to return other pilots pleaded to switch planes with him, but Tomonaga refused. With a touch of humor, he told him that the Yankees were only 90 miles away and that he could make it there and back on a single tank of gas. At 1331, the strike took off along with its escort of six fighters. Before their departure, Yamaguchi had reminded his pilots, there's two undamaged carriers left. Your mission is to take out one of them. It was imperative that this strike destroy at least one of the two undamaged carriers. This would then even the odds and make it one versus one. And with that result, the prospect of a Japanese victory wouldn't be so far-fetched. En route to the target location, the air group sighted a carrier task force 30 miles away at 1430. The carrier was not on fire, nor showed any indication that it was damaged. So clearly, this had to be one of the undamaged ones. Okay. Accordingly, Tamanaga settled on attacking this untouched force. However, unbeknownst to the Japanese, this was not a new carrier. It was the Yorktown again. American damage Bro, what? control had been superb, and following the dive bombing attack, the Yorktown's crew had been able to put out the fires and had restored enough of her boilers to bring her up to 19 knots. You know, I know, uh, I, you know what, there's some insane things, but this is probably one of the craziest possibilities. They've managed to fix it up and now it's able to actually move again. 
They stopped the fire. They managed to make it move again. I was there thinking, it's stationary. They're going to have to get help to get out. No. That's me looking at it. These people are... They're taking the fire out and then getting it to move again. This, I, don't, I don't understand how they've managed to do that. Thus, Hiru's second attack was about to be spent on an injured carrier. Tomonaga approached from the carrier's port quarter. He decided on executing a standard split attack. Radar had detected the incoming strike 45 miles out, but only six fighters were available. All six were sent to intercept, but only two found the enemy, shooting down a single torpedo bomber. Oh. By this point, the Yorktown had begun an evasive turn to starboard, giving Tomonaga a poor attack angle. In response, he divided his small force once again to conduct yet another Annabelle attack. The four planes were about to pass the outer ring of escorts when this picture was taken from the USS Pensacola. Note the heavy anti-aircraft fire that Tomonaga and his pilots had to fight through. Oh my, wait, so this is all gunshots? Oh, here. Oh, mate, look at that. This is cra Looking at these pictures, it, like, when you sort of see these videos, you don't fully I, I actually get to understand how scary and, like, real these situations are and these, yeah, this sort of stuff, these battles are. But looking at this, I mean, that's just insanity. Flipping, and they just persevere and keep coming. Both sides, I just can't, I got, I got to, like, just... I'm not saying respect it because they're fighting each other and obviously there's the side that when it was happening was the side that was the good side and then the side that wasn't the good side. But even then, these are just people fighting for their country, right? Both sides are just people full of like balls of steel. The Americans would have to throw everything they could at this attack to save their carrier. Fortunately, they had one of their own best pilots on scene. Lieutenant Commander Jimmy Thatch. Having just taken off from the Yorktown, he was determined to repel this assault. Coming in at 200 feet and flying at 200 knots, Lieutenant Tamanaga steadied his aircraft to make his torpedo run. To his right, a Wildcat came roaring towards him. It was none other than Jimmy Thatch, and he delivered a devastating pass at Tamanaga's plane. Damn. The aircraft was badly damaged and set on fire. Nevertheless, with nerves of steel, Tamanaga pushed on and with impressive skills, still managed to launch his torpedo. What? His plane crashed shortly afterwards, killing him and his crew. Bro, your plane's on, your aircraft's on fire and you're still able to think to shoot. Like, bro, it's mental, it's mental. Unfortunately for Tamanaga, his torpedo did not hit. His wingman also missed and was later shot down, and the other two of the group were also brought down with none of their torpedoes hitting their mark. However, their sacrifice was not in vain for it had lined up the Yorktown for the second division's attack. Oh no. These five swooped in and scored two devastating hits on Yorktown's port side. In summary, Tamanaka's attack had cost the Japanese five torpedo bombers and two zeros. The Americans had lost four fighters. A photograph captured the moment the torpedo struck. It was this attack that had dealt tremendous and decisive damage to the Yorktown. Bro, look at this picture. What the hell, man? She lost all power. Oh yeah, look at this. This has been absolutely destroyed. Three of her boilers were knocked out, her rudder was jammed, and with water gushing in, a severe list developed. It seemed apparent that the carrier would capsize at any moment which would have caused a heavy loss of life. So the captain ordered abandoned ship at 1500. The Yorktown was now definitely out of the fight. By 1545, Hiryu's surviving planes had landed. At this point, the Hiryu was exhausted. Mind you, they had been in constant action for the last 10 hours. Just 10 minutes after they landed, Nagumo received a report from his scout planes. It revealed the truth of Tomonaga's attack. The strike had hit the same carrier as before. So it was still one versus two. With the odds still stacked against them, the Japanese finally decided it was time to retreat and open the range with the Americans. Yamaguchi looked at what remained of his strength and it was pitiful. Only four vows and five kates remained. 
Incredibly, the Admiral was still determined to attack the Americans. He would send a dusk attack with these nine planes and then call it a day. But first, his exhausted men needed a respite from all the action. The men went into Eden Rest before launching their last counter-strike. Oh my days. However, the airmen would never get that chance. Why did Hiryu close the distance with the Americans all afternoon? At this point, there's a distressing issue that has to be discussed. It's the controversial decision of Nagumo to close the range with the Americans once they had been discovered. After the 1030 disaster, Nagumo had been left with a single carrier, the Hiryu. The importance of this carrier cannot be overstated. Nagumo was in possession of an expensive military hardware that Japan could ill afford to lose. The Japanese had to fight intelligently from this point onwards. Early reports had indicated that the Americans were closing the gap and only 90 miles away. So fair enough, hopes for a surface engagement was justified. Therefore, Nagumo's decision to charge northeast to close the distance was reasonable. But there is something wrong with this picture. It's this, the Hiryu tagging behind Nagumo's surface force. A carrier has no business in a surface engagement. Not only that, but closing the distance keeps you within the enemy's strike range. And this was absurd. Which is crazy because their strike, the, the strike range of the Hiryu is further. I remember learning last video, their strike range for the planes, that the distance they can travel is further. So why are you going closer? So why are they doing this? Why is the Hiryu still closing the distance with the Americans? Well, we don't really know. Maybe Nagumo believed the Americans were also seeking a surface engagement? But by 1240, this was shown to be highly unlikely based on the Americans changing course to the east, away from him. So what it seems like is that after 1030, the Japanese became short-sighted and got this type of tunnel vision where they were just focused on one thing, destroying the enemy. For both Nagumo and Yamaguchi, this fight had become personal. They were so determined to exact revenge and so caught up in the heat of the moment that they forgot to employ their assets carefully. Also, cultural and societal norms may have begun to cloud their thinking. Japanese society places a lot of value on honor and fulfilling one's duty. And we can see this occurring throughout World War II with many soldiers ending their own lives rather than being taken prisoner. See, that's nuts. Was that for the kamikaze bombers or whatever? That's just something else as well, man. Which was seen as a shameful act. There's a popular Japanese phrase that says, please continue trying to do your best. In other words, at this moment, winning was optional, but trying your hardest was not. Even if the situation was hopeless and doomed, they had to show that they were at least trying to win. But by doing so, they lost sight of the bigger picture. Saving this last precious carrier could have so well aided the Japanese in future operations. Both are to blame for this imprudent decision. It seems as if both were more concerned with preserving their personal honor instead of focusing on preserving this invaluable and irreplaceable carrier of their nation. Admittedly, striking back at the enemy had made good sense, but exposing your carrier to American air attack had not. So what they should have done is that they should have let the surface units close the gap, but not the carrier. They could have detached the Hiryu with an escort to the west and opened the range even before Tamanaga's force had taken off at 1330. Her aircraft still had the range to strike the Yorktown and make it back home. But instead, the Hiryu spent all afternoon closing the gap with the enemy. Only at 1550, when reports confirmed that the Hiryu was still facing two operational carriers, did she head northwest. But by this point, it was too little, too late. Oh no. The consequence for the reckless decision had already caught up to them. The Americans had lost contact with the enemy after the 1030 attack. They didn't know where the Hiryu was. So at 1133, the Yorktown began sending out search planes to regain contact with the enemy. And spotted it. One of these planes had already reached the search limit, but the pilot decided to push just a little further. At 1430, his perseverance paid off when on his return leg, he came across the Hiryu. It was only 130 miles away from Task Force 16, well within strike range. 
if the Kido Butai had turned northwest immediately after launching Tomonaga Strike at 1330, the Hiryu would have been 35 miles further oh, west mate. at 1430. And chances are, she would have never been spotted. So much for saving your last precious carrier. Look how many they sent as well. Was that 40 planes? 40 aircrafts? So it's now 5 o'clock, so it's still the same day. The Once Dunois. the Americans received the sighting report, a strike was immediately sent. The first wave was a mixed bag of Enterprise dive bombers with Yorktown survivors, followed by the Hornet, who launched her own strike 30 minutes later. At 1645, the first group sighted the Hiryu. The dive bomber swung around to the southwest so that they could approach with the sun to their backs. The two squadrons decided to concentrate on a ship apiece. The Yorktown bombers, much to their resentment, were selected to go for a battleship, while the 10 Enterprise dive bombers got the main prize of taking out the carrier. 13 fighters were on combat air patrol. These pilots were no doubt fatigued at this point. And the clever tactic of approaching out of the sun must have worked because for the second time this day, the Japanese were caught by surprise. They didn't spot the Americans until they were practically on top of them. And oh, this perhaps man. highlights the Japanese's greatest weakness in carrier warfare, their lack of radar. The Enterprise dive bombers began their attack at 1705. The carrier made a hard turn to port, this threw off their aim, and resulted in the first few bombs missing their mark. Thankfully for the Americans, the planes from the Yorktown saw this and diverted. Hiryu's time had come. Dive bombers were able to land a devastating total of four hits, all on the forward part of the Hiryu. Oh, shit. The powerful explosions ripped the forward deck apart. Although the Hiryu hadn't been as packed with filled up and armed aircraft like her three sisters, four bombs were enough to shatter this lightly armed carrier. Flight operations were out of order for the Hiryu. The remaining Dauntlesses went for the battleship but missed. 15 minutes later came Hornet's group. They ignored the Hiryu seeing that she was doomed and went for the cruisers, but to no avail. No hits were scored. In total, the Americans lost only three aircraft in the attack. All four carriers were now out of operation. Incredibly, Yamamoto still believed he could grasp victory from the jaws of defeat. He still entertained the prospect that Midway could be taken and that the American force could be destroyed in a surface battle. Bro, let At it go. At 1915, Admiral Kurita and his <laughs> cruiser squadron were ordered to bombard and neutralize Midway. The only hope left now for a victory was for a night action between Yamamoto's battleships and heavy cruisers and the American force of carriers and cruisers. Nagumo, who had been viewed as being too passive, was relieved of his command, and Admiral Kondo was left in charge for the upcoming night battle. However, by 2330, no contact had been made and it was obvious that no surface engagement was forthcoming. If he continued east, he would place his ships in a vulnerable situation the following morning against American air attack. So reality finally began to sink in, and shortly after midnight, he cancelled the bombardment of Midway and ordered Kurita to change course to the northwest and join up with the main body. Soon, orders for a general retirement of all his forces were sent, and at 0255, Yamamoto officially cancelled the Midway operation. Wow, well there we go. The scuttling of the Kido Butai. Back to the scene of devastation, the Japanese carriers had been caught in the most vulnerable state possible, with fueled up and armed aircraft on board. As mentioned, each bomb hit was made worse by the secondary explosions that took part inside the hangars. The fires were fed and nourished by the fueled up strike planes, the bombs and torpedoes that hadn't been stored away safely, the fuel in the fuel lines, and other flammable materials found throughout the ship. And efforts to fight the fires successfully were hampered by many reasons. One was the poor design of the Japanese carriers, which made them ill-prepared to absorb damage and continue fighting. Second, Fire holes and foam spraying systems were installed, but the water mains were damaged during the attack, rendering the systems inoperable. Damn. And also, Japanese fire control abilities were simply subpar. So the fire steadily prevailed. 
and despite their best efforts, Japanese damage control equipment and training were simply not up to the task. The fires could not be extinguished, and this sealed the fate of the carriers. Soryu and Kaga were burning wrecks. After much deliberation, the decision was made to scuttle them. The Soryu sank at 1913 and lost 711 men. The Kaga sank at 1925. She lost the most personnel of all the carriers, losing 811 officers and men. What? Wait, so they couldn't be saved by the ships, the nearby ships or anything? There was a lot of hesitation with the Akagi, being that she was the flagship of the Kiro Butai, but eventually she too was ordered to be scuttled. She sank the following morning, taking 267 souls with her. What the fuck? That is brutal, man. So when he says ordered to be. She sank the ship of the Kiro Butai, but eventually she too was ordered to, ordered to, to be, be scuttled. Scuttled? Does that mean the people on board decided that it's, they're just, they just can't fight it, so they're just going to let it sink? Surely the people on board aren't going to do that, but at the same time, maybe you're so exhausted. But So when it says the loss of these people, I guess there was more on board, but they were saved, I guess? Or was it literally everyone on board that was killed? I'm assuming some of them survived because they managed to get to safety or something, but... A lot of them didn't. Bro, this is the worst way to go. God damn. She sank the following morning, taking 267 souls with her. The Hiryu suffered the same fate. Fires had spread and could not be contained. And it was soon apparent that she was doomed. Admiral Yamaguchi, sticking true to the naval tradition, decided to go down with the ship. After a sentimental goodbye, Yamaguchi and a selected few stayed behind what? while the rest of the crew transferred. I mean, fair enough. Fair. En Maybe he was scared about going back to Japan and something happening to him, and that could have been a possibility, but still, to just stay there whilst it sinks, that is just <sighs> flipping hell. Imagine how scared you To a nearby destroyer. At 0510 on June 5th, she was also scuttled struck by a single torpedo. But incredibly, she didn't go down until hours later in the morning. It was just enough time for a Japanese biplane to take this astonishing photo. Apparent is the gaping hole at the front of the ship. Flipping hell. A portion of the elevator has been blown against the forward end of the island. Here's another classic shot of her, where we can see that the ship is still on fire amidships. The Hiryu sank some two hours after these photographs were taken at around 0915. 392 men were lost. Oh, mate. The decisive phase of the battle was over, yet clashes continued for the next two days, which led to the sinking of the Japanese cruiser Mikuma and the Yorktown. That's right, the stubborn carrier still hadn't sunk at this point. <laughs> I'll begin with the cruiser action. If we recall, Admiral Kurita, in command of Cruiser Squadron 7, had been tasked with bombarding Midway. Yamamoto ordered this mission to be cancelled 20 minutes past midnight on June 5th. However, the order was delayed by almost two hours before it got to Kurita at 0230. By this time, he was only 50 miles away from Midway. Regardless, he commenced his retreat by changing course to the northwest. But during this, a submarine was spotted. Evasive maneuvers were ordered, and during the confusion, the cruiser Mogami collided with her sister ship, Mikuma. Mogami oh, had her bow smashed and was left behind since she had to limp back home at a slow speed. The Mikuma faithfully stayed alongside her as an escort. The rest of the day, they escaped air attacks by Midway base bombers. But the next day, on June 6, they were bombed repeatedly but this time from carrier-based aircraft of Task Force 16. Five hits landed on Mogami, five on Mikuma, and one on a destroyer. Despite her collision damage and the hits, Mogami managed to escape, while ironically, it was the Mikuma that succumbed to her wounds. What the hell? American pilots took pictures of the mortally wounded ship. The destruction of the Mikuma is clear. The ship sank at 1930 with a heavy loss of life, with as many as 700 of her crew unaccounted for. Bro, what the hell? 
Retribution was obtained against the Americans. On June 4th, the Yorktown was abandoned, but despite appearing that she was about to capsize, she was found still afloat on the 5th. With the battle practically won and the Japanese in retreat, the idea of getting back to her and towing her to port seemed like a real possibility. So the next day, on June 6, the destroyer Hammond brought on board a salvage team. The destroyer remained moored next to the Yorktown to provide power. The team began to have progress. Power was restored, the list was corrected, and soon the Yorktown was being towed at three knots. What? But lurking in the waters was submarine I-168. She had been dispatched by Yamamoto to finish off the Yorktown. The submarine skillfully approached, unnoticed, and patiently waited for the perfect shot. Although five destroyers were on patrol, no one spotted the submarine. Oh, she no. closed in and at 1500 meters released four torpedoes. The first hit the Hammond, which split the ship in half, and the second and third hit the Yorktown. The carrier was done for, and the salvage team evacuated the ship. The following pictures tell the story. The Hammond is shown sinking here after breaking in half. As she was going under, her death charges exploded, killing more of her survivors nearby in the water. What? 84 the of her crew fuck? went down with her. Bro. Even with four torpedo wounds, the Yorktown still took a while to sink. And before she did, she rode on her back, revealing the gaping torpedo wounds from the submarine attack. On June 7th, the distinguished ship, the ship that had played such a pivotal role in Coral Sea and Midway, finally slipped beneath the waters at 0500. 57 men were lost. So many lost lives from the sinking ships, man. So now we can go to the final losses of the battle. Japan lost four fleet carriers, one cruiser, and 250 aircraft. 250? But they didn't have a heavy loss in pilots. Only 121 airmen were lost that day. What they truly lost were the four irreplaceable carriers and the experienced and highly skilled aircraft mechanics and technicians on board them. These men were difficult to replace. By best estimates, Japan lost 3,057 men. For the Americans, the cost had been relatively small for what they had accomplished. They had lost one carrier, one destroyer, and 144 planes. Which is crazy to think because right at the start, the US was like taking all the L's and it was Japan who seemed like they were on top. And then it just completely switched. Total losses in men, 362. So yeah, it's a massive difference. But this is... So how come... There's obviously half the amount of planes. How come more airmen from the US were killed? Was there two people in each plane or something? There was no question about it. The Battle of Midway had been a decisive American victory. Was that it? Damn, well, this was crazy, man. This channel is so good. I don't know if he posts anymore, but this is the last one. Should I react to this at the end? It's from the American perspective and stuff. The fact that Thatch distracted the enemy enough with his snazzy flying leading to the destruction of the carriers and then personally took out the Tomonaga to save Yorktown has all the feels of a main character storming through the cover. Is there films about this? There must be films about this. There's always films about these sorts of things. So I'm, I'm assuming there is a film about this, but yeah, if there is, maybe I could react to it or something like that on my Patreon, if that's a thing that people would want to see. But yeah, this is uh, part two of the Battle of Midway and the US victory was not looking very possible at the start but how things did change through the war and yeah hopefully you enjoyed this reaction and yeah until next time like subscribe and peace